So hello, everyone. Um, I'd like to welcome you all to our sixth and final episode of our future of foraging seminar. Um, today we've got, um, we're going to be looking at uh, complex decision making in primate foraging. We've got two uh, very interesting talks coming up from uh, Dr. Alexandra Rosati and Dr. Ben Hayden. Um, I'm Rory Bursford. I'm going to be hosting today. Um, and we also have um, two of our organizers on the panel, Laura and Hannah, and also uh, David Barak as our guest panelist. Um, so yeah, um, I'll first hand over to Laura, who's going to give an introduction to Ben's talk. So take it away, Laura. Uh, so it's a real pleasure to be introducing Dr. Ben Hayden, um, who will be giving our first talk today. Uh, ben um, received his PhD from the University of California, Berkeley, where he worked with uh, Jack Gallant on working memory, attention and decisions um, in the visual area of V4 of the macaque. Um, he then joined Michael Platt's lab uh, at Duke as a postdoc, where his work moved into um, topics including cognitive control, value signaling and, quite relevant today, foraging decisions. Um, he established his lab at the University of Rochester and has since moved uh, to the University of Minnesota, where he, he and his team work on a variety of questions. And today he'll be discussing one branch of his work on freely moving foraging behaviours. And yeah, it's a pleasure to have you. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Uh, all right. We're going to do this. Lauren, I tried this yesterday. Uh oh. It says too many video sources. Please ask your host to, host to remove a source and try again. Okay, so now, I'll, yeah, that's right. So I'll take off um, the other panelists and uh, panelists, I'll re-invite you uh, after Ben's talk. And just uh, a note to the audience that uh, if you have any questions during the talk, feel free to pop them into the ask a question box uh, and we'll have some time after uh, Ben's talk where we can uh, tackle any specific questions. Uh, and if they're more broad uh, discussion points, we can, um, we can kind of tackle them in our more broad uh, discussion after the two talks are over. So anyway, I'll just remove everyone else. Okay, and Ben, if you'd like to try and share your screen now, hopefully it will work. Did that work? Yeah, that's it. And now just uh, go for the presenter mode, oh, like present, and then hopefully we'll be able to see. Perfect. All right. Yeah. Does okay. Does that work? All right. Yeah, yeah we're good All to right. go. Thanks. Excellent. All right. Glad you're. Well, thank you very much for inviting me, everybody. And thank you, Laura, for the uh, wonderful introduction. You're the first person ever to get Jack's last name right and Michael Platt's first name right. So that's very remarkable, and it uh, represents a high degree of preparation. Uh, so uh, I'm very excited to be part of this talk series on the future of foraging, which I stole for the title of my talk, just to really uh, emphasize the point. Um, I, uh, I think I told Laura that I was going to talk about freely moving monkeys, but I actually decided to split it into half. So we're going to talk about a little bit of Pac-Man and a little bit of freely moving monkeys both today. So um, <clears throat> I'll just start by saying that the the premise of my lab is that we want to understand economic choices. We want to understand how the brain implements economic choices. But the, 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 the best way to do that is to understand them in naturalistic contexts. So um, understanding how decisions are made in the wild, how foragers make decisions, the psychology of that is actually going to be crucial for um, any kind of neuroscience of economic choice. And there's a bunch of examples of that, and I'm not going to really walk you through all of those in the interest of time. I'll just have some citations here. I'll point out that you get new types of behavior that aren't, um, you know, observed in other contexts in naturalistic situations. You get different patterns of old behavior. So my lab has found very different risk attitudes and uh, time or impulsivity attitudes when you try to make things more naturalistic. And that seems very important to us. And we've made a big deal about that. Uh, you get new patterns of neural activity that you don't see, and I'm going to talk about that a little bit today. And then you also just get new questions that you can ask that you wouldn't be able to ask otherwise. So uh, 
basically, you know, we've been sort of doing this. We've been sort of plowing this ground for about 10 years, and I'm not going to give you the whole history of it because I only have 30 minutes, but I'm just going to plug you into kind of where we are now on this. And I'm going to say that really uh, in the last few years, we've decided to kind of completely abandon the traditional way of doing neurophysiology in the laboratory, which is to have trial-based structure and kind of move to what we call continuous decisions or um, basically decisions that take place in extended periods of time over space where you can sort of adjust your choice continuously. And the classic example of that for us is what we call the Pac-Man task or the pursuit task when we're being a little more formal. And this is a task that was uh, developed by a postdoc in my lab, Alex Tomei, but really um, taken by a, a graduate student named Michael Yu, uh, who now has a faculty job in uh, South Korea. And uh, one thing I like about these kind of naturalistic tasks that makes them really fun is that I don't have to spend a lot of time telling you how the task works. You can actually see what's going on here. So this is a monkey sitting in a special chair and he's controlling his uh, joystick with his arm. And uh, you probably already figured out that he's controlling this yellow circle and trying to chase these squares that flee from him using a standard algorithm from video games. And he's trying to avoid these triangles that are pursuing him. So these are predators. So this is a... Uh, so this is actually a very rich and very powerful task, and we really love it. And there's a lot you can do with it. And I'm really only going to be able to tell you a very brief amount about it today. So here's just the formal task. Uh, just so you know, there's five different preys that differ in color. So there's no ambiguity. They differ in the amount of reward offered, and they differ in the speed with which they flee the monkey. And then, of course, there's five predators that differ in the danger. Uh, meaning that some of them move faster and have a higher penalty if they catch you. And so you have to avoid them more assiduously. Uh, and so we're actually working out the optimal strategy and this task is quite difficult and quite complex and we're working with some control theorists to uh, solve that problem. Just to give you a little bit of data, this is just a sample session that we collected a few years ago. Um, this is very, very typical. The black lines here are the, or the gray lines on the right panel are showing you where the monkey travels. And you can see the monkey does a pretty good job of sampling the entire space of the world, although he's certainly not uh, homogeneous. And you can see that the capture points are pretty evenly distributed. So this is not like a situation where the monkey always gets the prey cornered and then grabs it. Uh, we get a very rich and very uh, diverse set of behaviors, and that's gonna be very interesting and important to us as we sort of try to query what's going on in this task. Uh, it's become very standard now to try to get, you know, at least 30 or 50 neurons at a time. I'm not going to go through that. Basically, we're going to use population statistical approaches typically to analyze the data, although the story I'm going to tell you today is really focusing on single neurons. And although we've recorded in this task in a bunch of areas, in the interest of time, I'm just going to tell you one story, which is about my favorite brain area, the dorsal anterior cingulate cortex. And this is a very um, near and dear to my heart part of the brain that's located uh, as part of the, sometimes called the fifth lobe of the brain, the cingulum, the belt, which is Latin for belt, that encircles the um, corpus callosum on the medial wall of the brain. So this is a monkey brain, and you're looking at the medial wall here in this uh, section. And the region, um, the most rostral and um, uh, dorsal region is called the dorsal anterior cingulate cortex, and it has a lot of really interesting properties. Most importantly for this talk, I will say that the, the theories about its function are very abstract and high level. They're not very grounded in behavior. So they are things like cognitive signaling of conflict and signaling of recent outcomes and monitoring the status of the environment. And we're gonna kind of push back on that ungrounded explanation with the data that we're gonna show you today. And in fact, <clears throat> I'm gonna argue that in a foraging context, and this is a foraging talk after all, What's absolutely crucial, the entire scaffold of the way that you think about, the way that you organize your behavior is the physical world, is space. And this is something that comes across in the Foraging Theory book, which is kind of our lab's Bible. We talk about all the time. The physical world is important and everything else that happens in the decision-making is kind of a modulation. You can think of it as a modulation of things that happen physically. So just to jump right to the good stuff, <clears throat> what you see here, is a bunch of little colored squares. And each square represents the monitor. And the color of that pixel on the monitor tells you the firing rate of a single neuron when the, on the top row, the monkey avatar 
is located at that position in space. And so if, I don't know if you guys can, uh, actually I can't even see my own um, mouse, but if you look at these panels, you can see, for example, in the third panel session five cell 16, you can see a little yellow spot. That's basically kind of sort of conceptually similar to a place cell. That means that whenever the monkey's avatar enters that part of the screen, the right hand middle part of the screen, this neuron, this particular neuron fires a whole lot. And when it's on other part of the screens, it fires less. And um, that's really interesting because it tells you that this cell, this neuron has a map of the world within it. And this is, you know, we, we generally think of neurons in the anterior cingulate cortex as having these abstract high level variables, not as having these very grounded map-like um, representations. And it, it also tells us that not only does this neuron track the position of the self, it tracks the position of the prey and the position of the predator. And if you look at the third column here, you can see that the map for the self and the map for the prey and the map for the predator are all completely different. That's very typical. We find completely distinct, not uh, anti-correlated, but orthogonal maps of the world. So these neurons, these single neurons have multiple maps of the world within them. Uh, they are somewhat place-like. They're a little more abstract than place cell. They have very complicated tuning. Actually, we needed uh, some statistics that were developed from uh, Lisa Giacomo's lab working with Surya Ganguly at Stanford to see these kinds of patterns, but they're there and they're statistically significant. And so the, the kind of the key finding, I think, of this study of this um, paper, this niche communications paper that just came out a month or two ago, is that you have this very rich map that you would not have seen if you were not doing this kind of high level, high dimensional foraging like task. Um, and it comes out for free if you have the right, uh, if you're willing to do sophisticated analyses. Uh, you also see what I would call proto-social variables. So if you think of this task as essentially a social interaction between the monkey, his avatar, and then the prey that he's chasing, they have some relationship to each other. And we can ask whether these neurons, whether the firings of these neurons give information about the relationship between the subject and the prey that he's chasing. And uh, the answer is very clearly yes. Um, you can just see if you look at these um, radial plots here, that when the... Uh, if you just look at this first radial plot, which is in the second column here after the uh, legend, when the monkey is, so the, the convention of these is that up means forward. So if the monkey is heading in a direction and if the prey is on his right, which means he should probably turn to the right pretty soon, this neuron has a high firing rate. And if the prey is on his left, this neuron has a low firing rate. So this neuron gives information about the relationship between the self and the prey. And it's, that's information that could be used to drive behavior. Uh, and it's also information that could be used to just sort of represent the status of the world. Again, these are the same neurons, the dorsal anterior cingulate cortex. Now, the most interesting thing to us about this part of the, um, the world of possible task spaces is the question of whether monkeys think about the future. And I was uh, turned on to this question by a Templeton fellowship that I had a few years ago which gave me a little bit of money to ask the question of how much do monkeys think about the future? We can actually use some mathematical models that are in this nature neuroscience paper that I'm not gonna go into in too much detail because they're pretty complicated, but we can ask whether the monkey guesses the position of the prey as it's moving into the future and heads toward that direction and thus captures the prey a little bit more efficiently. And the answer, just to be very brief, is that yes, the monkeys tend to look forward in time about 700 to 800 milliseconds and this is a pretty big amount of time given that this task typically takes about five seconds per trial. <clears throat> they do a little bit more with practice. The more practice they have, the closer they get to this number. When the monkeys first start, they have around zero milliseconds. They don't look in the future. So it seems to be a skill that takes about two months to develop. Uh, we also find that when the prey are moving in a more complicated way, when they're more wiggly, the subjects look less far into the future. So there's a lot of interesting things you can do with this. And the key finding Neurally is that neurons also have maps for the future prediction uh, of the prey. So they represent, the firing rate um, correlates with where the monkey thinks the prey will go in the future. And the monkey is generally correct. And so it's also a map of where the prey will be in the future. So the monkey seems to calculate explicitly and represent in its brain a map of the future prediction of the prey. And then it probably, we don't have any evidence for this, but it would make sense, uses that information to guide their behavior into the future. So, um, you know, the next step uh, in this project is to really develop a sophisticated model, generative model that's going to predict where exactly the, what strategy the monkey is going to use from time to time. And we're going to look for the neural basis of this. 
Uh, we have a model that's starting to work. We're putting it all together right now. Uh, this is stuff we're doing with John Pearson at Duke. So ultimately, um, what I would just want to say about this Pac-Man task is it's kind of a compromise between the shared laboratory tasks. This monkey is still shared. He's using a joystick. It's indirect. It's virtual. And the real world, which is what we're actually interested in, but is much, much harder to implement. And we can ask very sophisticated questions of the type that we really could not ask with simple tasks. And we can get, I think, much richer and more complicated representational repertoires in these neurons and get much better theories about how these neurons behave in the real world, the daily life of humans. Uh, all right, I'm going to skip this. I'm just, I will say, this is another picture from a field site in Cayo Santiago where we went a few years ago. And, you know, the ultimate goal of my, my ultimate dream is to really understand monkeys moving naturally in the wild. And so the second half of my talk, I'm going to talk about what we're doing in that domain. So I will also say this is a very large project. It's taken, uh, I started on it about five or maybe, maybe now six years ago. And this, you'll see we've made some progress, but we haven't definitely haven't cracked the nut yet. It's taken three labs and five trainees, and there's actually a couple more joining that just signed their offer letters this week um, to do this project. So it's a big project. And what we did is we built this, um, this system here on the campus of the University of Minnesota. This is a cage. It's about three meters cubed. <clears throat> the cage has an exoskeleton around it with 62 cameras that film the monkey from every possible angle. We're generating uh, about 3.3 terabytes per hour. So just the just even the computer infrastructure took about like three months to figure out, and it costs a small fortune to do. Minnesota has been very helpful and supportive of this project. You can see the walls of this room and the cage are all green. That's a special color green called chroma key green. That's a green that's used in Hollywood for special effects, and we're going to use it for the same reason. We want to segment the monkey from the background as easily as we possibly can. Here's another view of the same thing. Uh, you can see all the cameras and you can see these barrels. And when the monkey is doing the task, he runs around. We put these little feeding stations at different places on the exterior of the cage. And the monkey can run, press a lever, get a little um, food or squirt of juice, whichever task we're doing that day. And um, and you can do a, a game in three, three dimensions. So now we've moved from a chaired task with virtual movement on a computer screen to actual movement in the real world. And again, you know, the theme of this talk is the future of foraging. Our goal is to understand the brain mechanisms of foraging, and we want to understand that in as naturalistic a way as possible because, again, we think we're going to get better and more meaningful data by doing that. So here's just a, a video of sort of what it looks like when the monkey's doing this. We, this is just 16 cameras. We have uh, actually 62 streaming. And the first problem, the hardest problem you have to solve is figuring out where the monkey is, right? So if you're doing... Um, an, a joystick task, the joystick gives you a continuous representation of where the monkey's arm is. If you're doing an eye tracking task, you have a representation of where the um, eyes are in space with a camera that's just a single variable. The monkey's position is actually much more complex. And so we developed this uh, system in a, uh, in a, <laughs> it took a huge amount of work, but we finally figured it out. Um, it's called Open Monkey Studio, and we published it last year um, with um, a project led by Praneet Bala, who's a really amazing computer science graduate student here at Minnesota. And it basically uses a convolutional pose machine and then a bunch of other tricks to track uh, 13 joints on the monkey. And now we typically do uh, 19 because we've improved it since that paper was published. <clears throat> I'll just say a little bit, if you're interested in this topic about tracking of monkeys, um, it is absolutely crucial, I think, for the future of foraging to understand where your subjects are in space and where all their joints are, because it's a very high dimensional representation of what they're doing. We feel like going back to the old way of doing things with eye movements and arm movements is like looking at the world through a, through a pipe. You can only see a very little part of it at the time, and seeing the whole body move as it moves in space is actually uh, much richer, and it gives you much more information. So here you have a monkey climbing around on the Ceiling of the cage, which happens quite often. We threw some grapes up there just to get this photo, but they do this all the time when they're bored. Um, you may have heard of Deep Lab Cut. Deep Lab Cut is a really amazing software tool, but it doesn't work for monkeys. Um, they basically, you basically need hundreds of thousands or even a million images to, for monkeys to work. And there's a bunch of technical reasons for that. And so our system is kind of uh, tailored for monkeys. And so uh, we like it. The result is that our Open Monkey Studio system, uh, which uh, other people, if you're interested in working with monkeys, if you're listening to this talk, give me a 
email and we can figure out how to set that up at your place. It actually works uh, just as well. In fact, we think better than the standard uh, marker system, OptiTrack system, which can only work on parts of the body like the face that where you can put markers and it doesn't work on the furry parts of the body, which are actually the most of the monkey's body. <clears throat> and the result of this is we have this system that can track a monkey moving. This is actually a uh, reconstructed video from a monkey actually moving around the laboratory. Just, and this also gives you a sense of the scale of the, you know, what, what it, what, how big the monkey is and how much space he has to move around. It's a, it's a much bigger uh, space than a chair and a joystick. Uh, I'm not going to go into this too much, but we're actually moving to a system where instead of 13 or even 19 joints, we have 40,000 points on the outside of the monkey. This is uh, how Zhang's work. <clears throat> I'll also just say, um, just in the interest of completeness, that a lot of everybody asks me this question. What if you don't have 62 cameras? What if you don't have a um, PhD systems engineer to build your computer system for tracking this? We are developing a system. Yuan, another graduate student in computer science, is building a system Called, which we're calling Open Monkey Wild, and we're we're most of the way there. We're now we think we're about ninety percent of the way there. That can track monkeys uh, from a single camera. We are working very closely with the Minnesota Zoo in Apple Valley, which is only about twenty minutes away from Minneapolis. Uh, to I'm just going to turn that off. This is a just a video of of the filming that we did, where we have actually the um, the largest collection of snow monkeys in the United States. And we're collecting the data from these monkeys as they move around their environment, both in snowy and in springtime conditions. And um, uh, from that, we're gonna do a lot of processing and a lot of magic and a lot of computer vision and computer science and be able to track the monkeys as they move around this environment. And so just to give you an example of what where we're at right now, this is a, I think this is a 17 point tracking of monkeys moving around the world with um, kind of high quality vision cameras. You can do this with like five to 10 monkeys simultaneously in the frame, which is about as many as you ever get in the frame. You could probably go higher, but we don't know that yet. So now we can start to do social interactions and we can start to identify what the, um, you know, where the troop is, the kind of the group high level decisions that these groups of monkeys are making and stuff like that. We can do the uh, lifting. So this is a kind of a standard thing in computer vision where you can infer the depth of something from a single image. Uh, you can guess how far and how deep it is in space. That's really important. We're, we're trying to build a system that can work with other primate species. You can see from these pictures that it's not perfect yet, but uh, we are looking, if you, if you are listening to this talk and you have a collection of, you know, at least 50,000 photographs of non-rhesus monkey or non-macaque primates that would help us and we'd be happy to take your data and um, work on that uh, with you here's just this is a very rudimentary thing that you can do even with video this is just downloaded youtube video from national geographic showing that you can kind of track these monkeys sort of um, more importantly for understanding foraging is dividing behavior is basically doing an automated ethogram this is uh, kind of the biggest focus of the lab right now, now that we kind of got the tracking working. Uh, I will say that there's a lot of things going into this, but the result is you do a UMAP, which is essentially a very fancy version of clustering. You can divide the behavioral space into natural clusters, and those natural clusters do tend to correspond to intuitive things like walking and climbing and sitting. And so what we think is gonna happen is that as this matures, we're gonna basically be able to replace the human uh, ethogrammer with an automated computerized ethogrammer that might be able to detect subtler things that humans can detect and for sure will be able to do it um, less expensively than sending uh, training graduate students for years to do an ethogram. Uh, I'm not going to really go through this. There's just some interesting things you can do with the behavior. You can divide it into mega clusters and see how those relate to each other, see how the transitions relate to each other. And then of course the most important thing for us is physiological recording. So this is a monkey doing the task and this is actually a single neuron that you hopefully hear if the technology is working. This is the fine rate of the neuron as the monkey does this task with this um, foraging system. We basically have an entire plexon rig, physiology rig on the monkey's head. It's very uh, elegantly designed and we download the data at the end of each day. This is a neuron in dorsal anterior cingulate cortex. This is the, the what's going on in the monkey's head. 
And I do want to show you some data. We just got this data last week. Uh, we've been recording in a bunch of brain areas. We analyzed ACC first because that's my favorite part of the brain. And David, this is a graduate student named David Mason. And um, just in, you know, in a brief period of about 30 minutes, the monkey moves around, samples the space pretty well. And the left panel here, you can see, this is basically looking down on the cage and looking where the monkey is in a two-dimensional plot. He tends to sit in this particular day around these two feeders. And we can sort of start to do very rudimentary things like detect spatial representations, place cell like representations in these neurons. And you know, again, most people, when they think of navigational variables, they think of hippocampus, medial entomidal cortex, but we have long believed that um, in more naturalistic tasks, you're gonna get very uh, rich and strong spatial navigational encoding in prefrontal regions as well. That's kind of a big research interest of ours. It falls into the broader category of when you make things more natural, what kind of representations do you see that you wouldn't see otherwise? So um, yeah, so anyway, this is basically the end of my talk. I think I'm at the end of my time anyway. Uh, just in case you're curious where we're going with this big cage system, we're gonna try to link the ethogram software to neural and see how the brain data predicts what pose you're in and whether you're gonna change pose. We also have another experiment that it didn't show you where we have two monkeys interacting and they can do whatever they want and they can forage socially and we call it encoding of social variables. And we're also collaborating with scientists here at Minnesota who study addiction, Parkinson's disease, other diseases to see if we could basically create a, um, a fingerprint, a movement fingerprint of the monkeys and see if we can quantify more precisely than has been done before the effects of these different diseases on behavior. And then of course, I already mentioned the navigational variables. So uh, with that, I will thank the funders, the Templeton Foundation, the Min Futures program was very important for starting this big cage stuff and the Templeton Foundation for starting the Pac-Man stuff. And then NIDA has been uh, very generous to us over the years. And um, the NSF has also been very generous to uh, understand the social monkey decision-making. And I will stop right there. Fantastic, thank you. Um, unfortunately, we've been having a few technical issues. So right now I'm the person on camera, not Rory. Rory was kicked out for some reason. Um, but anyway, thank you. It was a really fascinating talk. Um, we do actually have a question from the audience that uh, I will ask now, uh, if that's okay. So this is from uh, Vladislav, who says, fascinating technology. Does the video tracking recognize individuals or does it use ID information from other sensors or other annotation? That's a great question. Um, no, it doesn't do individuals yet. We think that's not going to be very difficult to do, but we haven't done that yet. And I actually, oh, sorry, I, I do have a question of my own quickly as well, if that's okay. Yeah. Um, so I, I think it's really, yeah, it's it's wonderful how you're able to capture the, capture this sort of natural behavior and have simultaneous physiology as well. It's kind of like the, you know, the um, gold standard really, right? Like it's the best of both worlds just to some extent. Um, but, I, you know, I was wondering how what you feel about uh, in terms of interpretation of the physiology in light of the complexity of the behavior, how, how you're able to like attribute, um, you know, certain uh, bouts of activity, for example, in, in your DACC neurons to specific aspects aspects of the behavior right so you said place cells for example as the animals moving around um I, you know and, and in particular locations but uh for example if the animal is, is socializing or foraging or moving um do, do you have ideas of how you will be able to differentiate what exactly it is that's contributing to changes in the activity yeah that is i mean i think that is the question and that is you know one of the main reasons why people have been very reluctant to do more naturalistic tasks the analyses get more difficult the multicollinearity problem, the correlation problem gets much more serious, and so you have to, um, you have to, you have to do two things. I think the answer, you know, the first one is you get, need a lot more data. So we get huge amounts of data, and we can really only we couldn't do this with single neurons at a time. We're now collecting like 200 neurons at a time, and we're doing that. We've done. We've been recording on our first animal for six months. Uh, so that's going to go part way towards solving the problem. And then the other thing you need to do is you need to change the kinds of questions that you can ask. So a lot of the kind of classic questions you would ask in neurophysiology are, how does the brain represent this variable? That type of question, that flavor of question may not be the kind of question that you can ask 
with this because of this multicollinearity problem and some other problems. So you, but there are, but that doesn't mean there aren't other questions that you can ask. And so part of what we're uh, doing, you know, that I didn't really talk too much about, although you can see hints of it, is coming up with other questions that are also interesting and also important. And I do think that as we move into this era of big behavior, I think we're going to have. Uh, is, is not just going to be, you know, answering the same old questions. It's going to be answering new questions that weren't askable before and that um, and, and, and abandoning old questions that we could have asked because they're too hard to answer now. Yeah, thank you. I think that's, yeah, I, I agree with what, what, what you said. Um, uh, so we actually have two more uh, questions. Uh, people are sort of get, jumping in now. Uh, oh. uh, we have, um, I think, from Rory, I think, uh, in your predator-prey task, have you also tried including a, a social cooperation partner? And if so, how do the, the ACC neurons react to this individual's position? So I'm guessing, like, you know, the other position, not the position of the, the own monkey. Uh, that's a great question. We have not done that yet we are training the first monkey to do that and um we're looking for a postdoc to do that that's a funded project but we don't have anybody to do it right now but we're still training the first monkey and we're going to start collecting data just to see what it looks like it's a great idea it's definitely something that we uh, find fascinating Okay, and we have one one last question. Um, and this is actually from Alex Kaselnik, who gave our sort of opening uh, talk. So it's nice to nice to see you, Alex. Um, and he asks, how are you linking the foraging theory in the Stevens and Krebs book to your technology? Oh, great question. Yeah, I kind of glossed over that. Um, we have done other work in the past that is more directly related to it. I would say the the big cage task, which I didn't really go into at all because I was trying to wow everybody with videos is actually a patch leaving task, right, from chapter two of that book. And so um, what, one thing, one of the many things that we're gonna do is we are going to look at the variables, the you know the kind of latent variables that the foraging theory book predicts, and we're gonna see how those are represented in the brain. We have some theories based on some shared tasks, um, stuff that I did 10 years ago even, that we think might be true in the real world, but we don't want to just assume that. And then there are a lot of things that we think might be wrong about those old shared tasks. And so the first thing that we're going to do is we're just going to ask how generalizable those old findings with shared tasks are to this new context where the monkey is is genuinely doing a patch leaving test with physical movement and presume, presumed action costs. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, I think that's everything we have time for for you for, you for questions for now. Yeah. Um, so I think, because Rory is still around, uh, he's just not on screen. So I think what he's going to do now is invite Alex, um, our second speaker, on screen and okay. maybe kick you out then. I don't know. If it, Alex, uh, All right, well, I'll put myself on mute regardless. Yeah, <laughs> perfect. Great. Hello, Alex. Okay, fantastic. And I am uh, going to introduce you now. Um, and so, sorry, I've got too many different screens open. This is the other problem. Okay, um, thank you so much for joining um, us. Uh, yeah, it's my pleasure to introduce um, Alexandra uh, Rosati. Um, so our second speaker today has made a great contribution to understanding the differences and similarities between humans and our close relatives, and what this can tell us about the human experience. She began her career in academia by completing a bachelor's in psychology from Harvard in 2005. And in 2012, she completed her PhD in evolutionary anthropology and cognitive neuroscience from Duke under the mentorship of Professor Brian Hare. Here, she studied spatial memory and decision-making in foraging primates, including chimpanzees, um, bonobos, and ooh, uh, strepsirines to provide insights into the evolutionary roots of human intelligence. She then completed a postdoc at Yale in 2015 before taking up a role as assistant professor at Harvard in 2015, and then began her current assistant professorship at the University of Michigan in 2017. Today, her group continues to produce fantastic research fusing evolutionary theory, cognitive science, and developmental psychology to make comparisons between primate species and gain insights into the dynamics governing the evolution of cognitive abilities in the context of sociality and foraging. So yeah, thank you again for joining us today. Um, and uh, if you can try sharing your presentation. Thank you very much for that introduction. I will get this going. Can everybody see that? That looks great, fantastic, okay. thank you. Great, um, so I'm really happy to be able to speak a bit about some of our work on cognition for foraging in non-human primates. Uh, since I will be talking about 
cognitive evolution, I thought I would kick us off with a quote from Darwin. And luckily, you can find a quote from Darwin about almost anything you want to study. Um, but he has a good one for what I'm going to be talking about, which is the greatest difficulty which presents itself when we're driven to the above conclusion on the origin of man, that is evolution via natural selection, is the high standard of intellectual power and moral disposition which he has attained. I mean, I really view my research program as aimed at trying to answer Darwin's greatest difficulty. And I'm doing this by integrating theory and ideas from evolutionary anthropology and evolutionary biology um, with methods and techniques and ideas from cognitive science. Um, so I'm an evolutionary anthropologist, but I sort of bridge these two fields. Um, our work, therefore, is sort of trying to grapple with two big questions. The first one is, how did human cognition evolve? Uh, and we're answering that by focusing on comparisons with other great apes, our closest living relatives. But we're also more generally interested in the question of how does complex cognition evolve at all? Um, and to address this question, we also branch out and do work with more distantly related animals like macaques, uh, as well as streptorine primates, uh, lemurs, uh, that can tell us something about evolutionary patterns in a more general sense. So to do this work, you know, it's, it's comparative work where we're looking at a lot of different species. So rather than having any animals of my own, I actually go to them. Um, and so a lot of our work takes place in African ape sanctuaries. So these are places that care for apes that are wild-born orphans of the bushmeat and pet trade. Um, but they free range in very large uh, forested enclosures, sometimes up to 100 acres of primary tropical rainforest. Um, so they're living a life that's very close to the wild. But because they are living in these sanctuaries, they actually come voluntarily into buildings at night to sleep. You can see that photo on the bottom here. Um, and this allows us to basically play games with with these animals, similar to what a developmental psychologist might do with a small child, to try to get at how they think and solve problems. I'm gonna be focusing today primarily on our work with apes, but I'm also gonna touch a little bit on some of our work with other species, where we're also focused primarily on animals that are living in sort of more naturalistic environments. So this includes uh, lemurs living at the Duke Lemur Center, um, as well as macaques at two different sites where these animals actually free range and we um, conduct cognitive experiments while they're free ranging. And I'll, I'll give you an example of that later in the talk. So, you know, I think that there's some really crucial insights that studies of other primates can give us into foraging and the evolution of foraging. And I'm gonna focus on three today. Um, the first, and the thing I'm gonna focus the most on is, is how comparisons across species can tell us something about the evolutionary function of different cognitive skills, including skills like decision-making or spatial memory that might serve an important foraging purpose. Um, and so I'll be talking a lot about our work comparing different species to see how they make these kinds of decisions. Another crucial insight that studies of other animals can give us is that they can tell us something about evolutionary constraints or how some skills may limit or even enable the emergence of other cognitive skills or other novel behaviors over evolutionary time. So by looking at the interrelationships and distributions of different skills across species, we can get a sense of which things are evolving together in tandem versus which are sort of more dissociated. Um, and finally, you know, putting this all together, other species, especially other primates, are really crucial for understanding how to bridge this, this gap, this seeming gap between human and non-human cognition. So what is different about our species compared to our close relatives? So, you know, the primary question I'm interested in is why does cognition evolve? And one of the classic answers to this question is that cognitive skills evolve to solve social problems. So this is sometimes referred to as the social brain hypothesis or the social intelligence hypothesis. Um, my work has focused on a different idea that's also um, been fairly prominent, which is that at least some cognitive skills might actually evolve to solve ecological problems. So in particular, I've proposed that uh, a subset of cognitive skills like decision making, executive functions, and spatial memory evolve in response to ecological complexity, not social complexity, and they serve a foraging function. So not everything is necessarily evolving to serve this in response to ecological complexity, but the proposal is that this sort of targeted set of skills is primarily evolving in this context. So this has sort of motivated a lot of my work looking at chimpanzees and bonobos, who are together our two closest living relatives. Um, and in addition to being our two closest living relatives, uh, chimps and bonobos have a very interesting set of differences in their wild socioecology that let us tease apart some of these ideas about how ecological complexity um, might shape cognition. Um, in particular, uh, compared to wild bonobos, Chimpanzees living in the wild uh, uh, appear to have larger day ranges or bigger spaces. So they're um, moving through larger, potentially more complex spaces in the wild. 
uh, chimpanzees eat less terrest terrestrial herbs. Um, and so you can think of terrestrial herbs as being something like a big salad bowl on the ground everywhere. So rather than eating as much terrestrial herbs as bonobos do, chimpanzees actually focus more on fruit, which are patchily distributed resources that require maybe different kinds of memory or decision-making skills in order to um, effectively exploit. Um, in line with that, wild chimpanzees seem to face longer search times between different patches of fruit, um, as well as greater variation across seasons in the uh, availability of their preferred foods. Um, and finally, compared to bonobos, chimpanzees um, are quite notable for engaging both in high rates of hunting, so wild chimpanzees will hunt and eat monkeys, um, as well as uh, a lot of effortful extractive foraging or tool use. So bonobos do hunt a little bit in the wild, but at much, much lower rates than chimpanzees. And actually they've never been observed to engage in extractive foraging in the wild. So based on this complement of features, we predicted that there would be some kind of signature of this wild ecology in the minds of chimpanzees versus bonobos, where chimpanzees would be more patient to deal with their distributed resources. Um, they would be more willing to accept risks because of this kind of hunting, risky hunting and seasonal variation. I mean, also that they would have more robust spatial memory because they're dealing with these larger spaces. So to give you an example of how we test this kind of stuff, I'm gonna go back to one of our earliest studies looking at eight patients. Um, this is a study looking at how chimpanzees versus bonobos make, make intertemporal choices. So I'm just gonna play this little video as an example. This is a chimpanzee making a decision between a smaller reward, two grapes on the left. If, they, if he chooses that reward, he knows he'll get it immediately. Um, or he could choose six grapes on the right, and he knows that if he chooses that, he's gonna to have to wait some amount of time. What I want you to do is pay attention to how long it feels to be waiting um, in the way that this chimpanzee is choosing to do. And there he goes, he chooses by flipping this little plastic thing. And now the delay has started. So remember this chimpanzee has actually had a lot of experience with this task already. He knows how much he's gonna to have to wait. Um, and now he's sitting to wait through this delay. So if you're like me, you're already getting super bored because this chimpanzee is waiting quite a long time. I, I, I think I'm probably a very impatient person and it was uh, quite, quite a long delay to experience the amounts of time that a chimpanzee is willing to wait just to get another, uh, another four grapes. Um, actually, we are only about halfway done. I think the one minute mark will hit in a, right now. Um, this chimpanzee is choosing to wait two minutes. So just keep that in mind that this is how long chimpanzees are willing uh, to wait in this particular context. Um, I'm going to skip through the rest of the video just because it takes forever. Um, and actually, that video is reflective of how long chimpanzees were willing to wait on average in this sort of delay titration. So this is showing that the point at which chimps versus bonobos were indifferent between that larger delayed reward and that smaller immediate reward, chimps were on average willing to wait about two, two minutes before they switched back to that immediate reward. Bonobos also waited a fair amount, but less so than the chimpanzees in line with this ecological prediction. Um, and just for comparison, here are two New World monkey species tested in a similar manner. Um, and you can see that they are only waiting a couple of seconds each compared to these longer durations of the apes. So, you know, the apes are waiting quite a long time compared to a lot of animals tested in comparable ways. But we also see this ecological this, this difference in line with this ecological prediction for chimps and bonobos. Um, just as a note, we actually see that bonobos match the predictions of long-term rate maximization in this particular context, whereas chimps are actually more patient than expected by long-term rate, max rate maximization. Um, we've also looked at uh, risk taking uh, in order to understand how they um, deal with decisions about probability. Um, to look at this kind of decision making, we've often used a task where they're making decisions about food quality rather than quantity. So in particular, apes are making a choice between one option where half the time they can get a, a preferred food reward like a, a banana, um, but half the time they might get a non-preferred food like a cucumber, um, or they can play it safe and take an intermediately preferred food uh, like peanuts. So the idea here is that we show that the bananas are more preferred than peanuts, but the peanuts are more preferred than cucumbers. So basically apes can gamble on the possibility of winning that banana, or they can play it safe and take that known um, sort of okay food. 
Um, in these kinds of tasks, we're normally trying to get at their more spontaneous problem solving abilities. So they don't typically have lots of training or experience in the task, but they always do um, complete various controls to ensure that they actually understand the task. And across a whole bunch of different studies, we've pretty consistently found that relative to bonobos, chimpanzees are more risk seeking. Um, so I wanna emphasize, this is not to say that chimps are always choosing risky options or that these species don't flexibly modulate their choices in sort of a rational way when we adjust the rewards in, you know, involved in the task, but rather that when we test them in a match context, chimpanzees seem to be pretty consistently more risk seeking than our bonobos, whatever level of risk seekingness that they are showing. Um, the last example I want to show you guys about the apes um, it concerns the development of spatial memory. So we've developed a variety of spatial memory tasks trying to get at uh, using spatial memory in a more naturalistic foraging context where animals are, for example, sometimes moving around. So in this task, we take advantage of the fact that there are several large enclosures at these sanctuaries where we can actually enter the enclosures and hide food. Um, and so what we do is we show the apes that we're hiding food at several test locations in the enclosure next to various landmarks. Um, there's also control pieces of food that we've hidden in there uh, to, but they didn't see us hide them in order to make sure that they're not just detecting food based on olfaction or some other um, modality. And then we let the chimpanzee or the bonobo into the enclosure to search around for some period of time in order to see if they preferentially target those test locations where they've seen food be hidden. Um, in this particular example of this kind of task, we tested 73 chimps and bonobos between the ages of two and 13. Um, there were four test locations and four control locations, and they had to wait about 10 minutes before they could go enter that enclosure to search. Um, we've done different versions of this with different quantities of food and delays. Um, and we typically are finding a pattern like this. While where chimps and bonobos show similar performance when they're very young, when they're infants, um, they typically find about one piece of test, uh, test food in that enclosure. As chimps grow up, they become uh, increasingly better at this task. So they're finding significantly more test over control pieces. Whereas bonobos actually don't show any developmental change. So this is an example of how um, changes over development can lead to these mature differences in cognition. Um, importantly, both of these species show high performance on control tasks where there aren't any um, major memory demands. So this isn't a food motivation difference or a difference in how willing they are to travel. It seems to be something more specific to memory. So another way we're trying to test this idea is actually to, to zoom out and go to the strepsirine lemurs. Um, and I think lemurs are a really exciting example of how to understand cognitive evolution because they show a, a great amount of diversity and evolutionary characteristics. So we've been really focusing on four species of lemurs, rough lemurs, mongoose lemurs, ringtail lemurs, and cockerel fox. And the reason is because they show this targeted variation in both their social systems and their ecological uh, uh, foraging niche. So for example, rough lemurs um, are more frugivorous than the other species, but they live in kind of intermediate, uh, immediately complex uh, social groups, whereas shafox are obligate folivores, so they eat this more simple food like finding leaves, but they, they have actually a very similar social system. So based on this, we would actually predict that if ecology is driving cognitive evolution, the rough lemurs are gonna outperform the shafox. Um, conversely, looking at the mongoose lemurs and the ring-tailed lemurs, they have a similar kind of intermediate diet, but whereas the, uh, the ring-tailed lemurs live in these large complex groups, the mongoose lemurs live in very small groups. Um, so there, if social complexity is driving cognitive evolution, we should really see the ring-tailed lemurs are outperforming the other species. So this allows us to contrast social and ecological hypotheses within the same data set across these species. I mean, actually, when we look to some of these uh, foraging skills, uh, what we see is that actually pretty consistently these folivorous species are doing better, especially in comparison to this, uh, sorry, the frugivorous species is doing better, especially compared to this folivorous species that's eating more leaves. So for example, we've done versions of the same spatial memory task that we did with apes, um, looking at these lemurs, where there are test locations where they've experienced food and control locations where they haven't. Um, and we see that the frugivorous rough lemurs outperform other species on this task, as well as other tasks tapping other components of spatial memory. Um, we've also looked at several aspects of decision-making, uh, like intertemporal choice, motor inhibition, short-term memory, reversal learning, um, and novelty seeking, and consistently found that that folivorous shafak is doing a uh, very different pattern of responses, performing worse than the other species. 
So overall, this suggests that actually multiple cognitive skills that I'm arguing are for foraging do in fact vary with ecological complexity in lemurs. Now, I think this is important, like thinking about this in, in, in relationship to human cognitive evolution, because some of these features that I've been talking about are actually core features of the human ecological niche or the ecological niche of human foragers and hunter gatherers. So here's some sort of summary uh, information about chimps, bonobos, and human foragers. And I want to point out a couple of things. First off, human foragers have enormous day ranges. Um, so human foragers travel huge distances compared to other great apes. And they also have this special foraging pattern of central place foraging where they gather food and bring it back to a central camp, which is quite distinct from feeding on the go, which is common for most other primates. What this means is that human foragers deal with much more uh, difficult patience and spatial memory problems than do other uh, non-human apes. Um, humans also exhibit high rates of of provisioning, so sharing food. And a lot of theorists think that this is because it mediates the high risks or the high variance in returns that are associated with the kind of food that humans eat and this sort of uh, central place foraging pattern. So this sort of lines up with the idea that humans might have to deal with special problems related to risk taking and maybe use cooperation to solve those problems. Um, finally, humans uh, uniquely have cooked food in the diet. Um, so this is a, a behavior that requires quite a lot of patience as well as other executive functions. And I'm gonna get into that in a little bit. So in this last bit of the talk, I wanna talk about how we can extend these foraging skills, these cognitive skills that I'm arguing are for foraging into other domains. Um, in particular, I think that the skills that might be evolving in the context of foraging actually feed into things like logical reasoning, um, cooperative or social decision making, um, as well as capacities for cooking food. So that is, cognition for foraging can enable complex fe flexible behavior in other contexts that we think are especially important for understanding human cognition. Um, so as one example, uh, you know, a, a lot of these tasks I've been talking about clearly require some kind of ability to conceive of probabilities or think about um, probability, probabilistic variation. Uh, but you know, one question here is, what is the role of logical reasoning, of actual logical inference in this understanding? So obviously animals must understand something about probability or they couldn't do the task. But humans seem to have a special capacity to actually make logical inferences about statistical likelihood using inferences to generalize between samples and populations, not necessarily with any particular experience, just using logic. So for example, young infants can actually engage in this kind of statistical reasoning, even when they're pre-verbal um, and make one-shot predictions about what are likely outcomes. Um, for example, infants can, can correctly predict that it's most likely that that blue object would fall out of a container like this, as opposed to these yellow objects, because there are um, more yellow objects. So the proportion of yellow to blue objects means it's most likely a yellow object will fall out. So there's some evidence from animals using similar uh, techniques to get at whether or not they also can make these kinds of inferences. But these are all using experiential tasks where animals gain experience over several trials. So they could be you know, solving these tasks using different kinds of learning mechanisms than are humans. So we wanted to ask, can other animals also make these kinds of one-shot predictions about likelihood without any experience, but just using sort of logical reasoning? Uh, so to, we, we adapted this infant study in order to test this in actually free ranging rhesus monkeys um, using a looking time methodology. So first I'm gonna show you what we showed the monkeys and we, we finally call this the monkey bingo study. Um, and what we did was we showed monkeys this sort of raffle drum full of fake, fake fruit. So here's what it looked like. So what you see is an, uh, Francesca Di Pacciolo who led the study, rotating the raffle drum and then one item falls out. Um, and we could vary whether or not the item that fell out um, largely matched what was in the raffle drum versus didn't match it and thus was statistically implausible compared to the matching object. Then what we would do is film the monkeys responses to these different events like this. So monkeys would see the event and then we would code frame by frame how long they look at this. And the logic of looking time methods is that animals and babies will look longer at events that they think are unlikely or unexpected. Um, so in an initial whoops, in an initial probability inference task, um, we we found that actually 80 monkeys uh, look statistically look longer at statistically unlikely outcomes. So monkeys seem to discriminate this statistically likely outcome from this unlikely outcome. 
Um, and we also had um, some controls showing that, in fact, this wasn't just because of the perceptual mismatch. So when Francesca took that fruit out of her pocket, so it wasn't actually coming from the same population of fruit, they didn't seem to have any expectations about whether or not that would match the overall ratio of fruit in the drum. So it seems like they were actually making a logical inference about what was plausible. So that's an example of how something that might be for foraging can actually um, scaffold the emergence of logical reasoning capacities. Another thing we've been really interested in is how um, some of these foraging cognitive skills might lead into social decision-making skills. Um, so in particular, there's this general question or, or problem that the scope of human cooperation seems to really exceed that that we see in other primates. So humans seem to be much more cooperative than other species. So why is this the case? Um, well, one way to reframe this question is to ask, what are the cognitive mechanisms that are differentiating human cooperation from non-human cooperation? And some folks have proposed that, in fact, one of the key differences here is that human cooperation is intuitive. Um, and that means that human cooperation is sort of a fast, automatic response, um, that humans cooperate kind of on impulse, whereas other animals actually have to put the brakes on selfish behavior in order to cooperate. And so that this difference in terms of the sort of intuitive or automatic response of cooperation between humans and other primates might play a crucial role in this difference in the cooperative scope of human behavior. So to test this, we actually um, tested chimpanzees on a battery of decision-making tasks that comp comprised both social tasks and non-social tasks. So for example, we looked at whether they would make pro-social decisions, whether they would um, hand out of, re out of reach objects to uh, a person in need, whether they would punish a thief who had stolen a resource, and then we also tested key aspects of patience and value-based decision-making. So we looked at um, how patient they were, um, how able they were to inhibit motor responses. Um, and we also looked at their interest in different kinds of social stimuli. So first off, what we found here was that, um, in fact, chimpanzees um, show a slight preference for pro-social responding in this resource donation task. And actually, if you look at the patterns of their choices, Chimpanzees that make fast choices are actually more pro-social than chimpanzees that make slow choices. So this is in line with the kinds of patterns we see in humans, which is that pro-social responding is intuitive or fast response, whereas other kinds of choices are more, um, are, 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 are selfish choices are actually the result of a longer period of potential deliberation. Um, similarly, we found that chimpanzees that make faster uh, helping responses are faster punishment responses are actually more likely to do so at high rates. In the second part of this study, we looked at whether self-control constrains cooperation. Um, so we looked at whether individual variation in self-control actually predicts how cooperative that individual chimpanzee is. So for example, we saw that there was quite some variation in how willing individual chimpanzees were to wait for larger delayed rewards in an intertemporal choice task. Um, and then we looked at whether it predicted uh, resource donation, instrumental helping, um, and second party punishment. And actually the finding was that individual variation in chimpanzee patients, as well as motor inhibition, did not seem to predict individual variation in cooperation, which suggests that actually these foraging capacities are not constraining um, the expression of social decision-making in non-humans. The final example I'm gonna give is transitioning from foraging to cooking. Um, and this might seem like kind of a funny question, but the reason we're interested in this is because human ecology is uniquely dependent on cooked foods. Um, and there's actually a major hypothesis that cooking was adopted fairly early in human evolution, um, and that that drove a lot of the major changes we see in our species. Um, and one way to test this is to look at whether other apes have the abilities that would be needed to cook food. So obviously they don't cook their food, but can they solve problems that emulate cooking? And this can allow us to understand this transition from, a, from a, an ape, an ape-like ancestor that's foraging on fruits and, and plant material to, to our own ancestors that seem to have eaten cooked food. The way we asked this was asking, can chimpanzees cook their own food? Um, and what we did was we developed what we fondly call the chimpanzee microwave, which is basically just a container where if you put a raw piece of food, like this raw piece of potato in it, um, and then you shake it, it comes out cooked. So it's something we know that the chimps have never seen before, um, but we can test their intuitions about how something like cooking might work. 
So just so you know what this kind of looked like, this is an example. What you see here is a chimpanzee um, who's been given a slice of potato. He can either choose to put it in the cooking device on the left that transforms food or a control device on the right that doesn't transform food but can be manipulated in the same way. And here's what this looks like. So what you see here is the chimp is picking up the food, placing it in that control, uh, the, the chimpanzee microwave. The experimenter is shaking the microwave and then actually this food is coming out cooked. So across a whole set of studies, what we actually found was that chimpanzees have many of the core capacities needed to cook food. That is, they can generalize their foraging cognition to solve these novel problems. Um, they prefer cooked food. They're willing to wait for cooked food in an intertemporal choice context. Um, they are willing to put food in their own hand in this device in order to, it, to have it be cooked um, with fairly minimal experience. They selectively only cook raw food, so they don't try to cook cooked food or other kinds of items, suggesting that they understand something about this transformation. They can actually transport food some distance in order to put it in this device. And they can even accumulate and save raw food over the order of a couple of minutes in order to put it in the cooking device at a later time point. So this is the kind of work we're trying to do. And I just want to mention one of the last things that I think is really an important future direction for thinking about the future of foraging. And that's co uh, contextualizing cognition in the wild. Um, and the way we're trying to do this uh, is by partnering with African sanctuaries to not only do these kinds of um, experimental tests of cognition, but also integrate this with focal observations of these chimpanzees' real world behavior that are modeled in the wild protocols that field primatologists use to study chimpanzees in the, in the wild. Um, and we're marrying that with a, a, a collaborative project um, with the Kibali Chimpanzee Project in Uganda, where um, there are unparalleled observations of these wild chimpanzees, sometimes thousands and thousands of hours of individual chimpanzees' behavior. Um, and we can actually test the real world impact of this behavior on things like uh, reproductive success, rank acquisition, and other biological outcomes. Um, so to sum up uh, what I was talking about today, uh, you know, I think one general conclusion is that non-human primates have real complex cognition across several different domains, that there's clear variation across species. So there's no one primate cognitive model. Um, different primate species think differently. And I've argued that this reflects adaptive variation for solving ecological problems. Um, and finally, I would argue for the need for a holistic view of multiple skills and understanding the links between these skills in order to understand how complex real world behavior is generated. So I just wanna thank everybody, our funders, but especially the primate sites that we work with uh, because this kind of work would be impossible without these long-term partnerships with several different sites caring for different species of primates. Thank you. Lovely, thank you for the for the excellent talk. We do have a few questions. The first uh, question that was really burning, um, like in the minds of myself and the co-organizers, how does the device work to cook the food? I mean, it doesn't cook the food, does it? How, what, what is it? <laughs> no, it doesn't. You know, actually, it's a funny question because we originally did intend to cook the food. We had this uh, we had this crazy idea. We brought a camping cooker and we were going to have like a pan on it. But we very rapidly realized that this would be incredibly dangerous. It was a terrible idea. So we 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 thought on our feet, and actually, that magical cooking device it just has a false bottom so you, you you if you paid very close attention to the video you would see that actually it was two bowls stacked on each other so they put the raw piece in one we shake it there's actually you can't hear it i think when i played it but there's like a noise that sounds when it's shaking um like and then when you open it actually the cooked food is coming out of the second false bottom so it sort of creates the illusion of being a microwave basically but is not actually doing anything particularly fancy I mean, I suggested it was magic, but okay. <laughs> um, so we also have a question from the audience. Um, if I can find it, it's moved. Uh, yes, here we go. So um, Aditya uh, Raja Gopalan um, asks, are there animals in these sanctuaries that have grown up in captivity um, or in a more constrained environment? Do they show differences in the measured cognitive abilities compared to animals that have grown up in the wild? Um, and they're saying that they're curious how much the nature of an individual's life history affects their cognitive abilities in comparison to evolutionary differences? I think that's a really great question. And the first thing I would want to emphasize is that I think one of the, um, one of the important things about testing these animals in these ca captive contexts when we're thinking about species comparisons is that we're actually better able to equate the environments that the different species are living in in their own individual ontogenies. So for example, chimps and bonobos in the wild 
could plausibly have differences in spatial memory because they're experiencing different environments in their own lifetimes. Whereas chimps and bonobos in these sanctuaries, they're all part of the Pan-African Sanctuary Alliance. So they all um, are experiencing fairly similar sort of care regimes. Um, and for example, they're all provisioned. So none of them are actually needing to forge that much on their own. So these differences we're seeing, I think, reflect something that's more like a biological predisposition for that reason, similar to the Duke Lemur Center where all these lemurs are living in the same context. In the sanctuaries, these animals, um, they, they're orphans of the bushmeat and pet trade. So typically what's happened is that their mother has been killed and they've been, somebody's trying to sell them in the market when they're a baby and they've been confiscated. Um, the sanctuaries have implemented like a really fantastic care regime where these animals actually get a surrogate human parent and then are integrated into a natural social group very rapidly. Um, so as a consequence to that, while you know, they're not in the wild and we don't probably know that much about the cognition of wild animals because it's very hard to do experiments in the wild, um, they're probably as close as we can get. And what we know about these animals is that they seem to be quite um, psychologically and physically healthy compared to a lot of other captive populations in zoos or labs. So for example, they have uh, healthier weights, healthier blood lipids. We've showed that in some of our work. Um, in our observational work, I can tell you, we effectively see no aberrant behavior, despite the fact that this is sometimes quite common in laboratory populations of chimps. So we basically never see things that could be quite common in other populations, but we see very high normal rates of the normal behaviors they should be showing, like um, grooming, social interaction, actions, feeding on food that's being given to them, so on and so forth. So based on this sort of holistic pattern of their behavior, their cognition, and their development, we, we think they're probably normal. There are a few um, mother-reared individuals in these sanctuaries, and we also have done some work comparing them to the orphans, because uh, you know these sanctuaries uh, typically have the animals on hormonal birth control, but some of them have an accident. Uh, and we haven't really found major differences between those mother-reared individuals and the orphans. Lovely. And before we go to the panel discussion, I have one last question actually of my own. Um, I, you know, I really enjoy your comparative approach and, and uh, you know, I found intriguing your, your use of tasks uh, originally designed for humans, like human children, um, and applying them to uh, non-human primates. And, you know, I understand that you study non-human primates and not humans, but um, I was wondering, what, what do you think about in terms of like sort of translating the other way, let's say, you know, using naturalistic or uh, sort of uh, type behaviors um, and studying them in humans? Do you think that that is a, a good direction to go in, for example, or, um, you know, moving away from sort of more like uh, standard cognitive tasks or, yeah, I was wondering what your opinion on that is. Yeah, I, I think that is a, you know, it's not our focus, but it's something we're very interested in. So for example, that risk task I showed, we've actually used that with humans where they're making decisions about food. And we parallel the the eighth task where we sort of provide minimal verbal instructions. Um, and we found that actually when you test humans on that kind of situation, they look more risk prone. They actually look quite similar to chimps when they're making decisions about food. If you do the same setup, but you test them um, for decisions about monetary rewards, that's actually when they start looking more risk averse. Um, I know Ben also had some work um, doing similar kinds of things. So I do think that actually this kind of back translation from the animals to humans is important because we can also test humans in maybe a couple of different contexts, sort of like the standard human decision-making context and then this more animal context. And you know, I think the global message of context matters and is gonna impact what animals and what humans are doing is really important. So um, you know, it's important not to just assume we know how humans would react to a problem when they're being often tested in situations that are very different from how we would typically test an animal in a nonverbal experience-based task. Great, thank you. Um, so I think what will happen now is that Rory uh, is going to add the others back on screen and himself, I hope. <laughs> um, and then we will have a nice little discussion, panel discussion. And if anybody who is still in the audience um, would like to ask any further questions, you're very welcome um, to do so. Um, let's see if, if here we go. Going in the right direction. <laughs> I think we need Ben and David. Hopefully they will join in soon. Great, we've got David. <laughs> Crowdcast hasn't been playing very nice today at all. It's been very uh, finicky, but excellent. Okay. 
And so the last person is Rory himself. I'm not sure, should we? Is Rory going to join us? He's going to try, I think, on another laptop. Um, but we do have another question actually from the audience um, in the meanwhile. Uh, um, and actually, oh, this seems like it's one really for you, Alexa Alexandra. So if, if you wouldn't mind if I, if I ask that question on uh, uh, Vladislav's behalf, um, he's asking, uh, or oh, sorry, uh, that they're asking, do you think the chimps would be able to overcome their aversion to excessively hot or cooked food and learn to wait for it to cool down without extensive training? Yeah, I mean, you know, you know, you know, you know yeast was not hot at the time of test, so I, we didn't specifically test that. But I, I don't think that I, I think that. Well, honestly, they probably could tolerate much higher temperatures than we could on, in the first place. But yeah, I don't think that they would actually find that very challenging to to intuit. For example, wild chimpanzees actually will monitor um, bushfires, and they seem to, you know, there's some suggestion that they even understand something about the impact of bushfires, where they'll kind of wait for bushfires to move through. They're not necessarily even afraid of them in the way you might think. Then they'll move into the, the forest where the bushfire has gone through and actually will eat the burned nuts and other things there. So given the fact that we, we do see wild chips doing something like that, my guess is that they could intuit something like that pretty, pretty easily. Excellent, thank you. Um, so I will, uh, before we get started, I hope, sorry, Rory, I feel like I'm taking it away. <laughs> um, but I, I will quickly introduce uh, David, who is also joining us today. Um, he's a presidential uh, scholar um, at the University of Columbia. Um, and yes, thank you so much for joining us uh, today. I mean, I don't know if you if you have anything in particular that you want to ask to, to get us sort of kicked off with this panel discussion. Uh, thank you for having me on today. Those are two uh, wonderful talks, very interesting, lots of different avenues to pursue. I'm gonna ask uh, to kick things off a general question and I hope uh, both uh, Ben and Alex, you can contribute your thoughts. Uh, and it, it is maybe a, a sort of a wide view kind of question, and it has to do with what exactly is going on in the brain when animals are making foraging decisions. Of course, foraging is a fundamental demand on all mobile organisms. And I'm wondering how you each conceptualize what animals are doing when they forage. And in particular, are there sort of, is there a, I hate the word module, but it, in this case, it might make sense to think of there as being something like a foraging module and certain animals are better at it than others, or is, is foraging just a set of behaviors and what animals are doing is they're cobbling together aspects of memory, spatial cognition, value representation, and so forth in order to fill those foraging demands. So uh, are there foraging computations uh, specific and, and can animals be better or worse at them? Um, and how do you conceptualize your own work as related to um, that set of questions? Uh, I, will, I, will, I will hazard a guess. I, uh, you know, I come from a very particular perspective, which is basically I don't believe there's any modules for anything at all. So um, I don't think there's any foraging modules unless you do something silly, like say the whole brain is a foraging module. Um, so, uh, yeah, that's my glib answer, but it's what I actually believe. Sorry, Alex, we can't hear you. You're oh, there we go. I Did I do it now? Okay, sorry. Um, yeah, I mean, I would, I would say I agree. I don't think that there's a foraging module, but maybe there's a set of mechanisms that are more geared towards foraging, and some of them might be more specific than others. So, um, I, I think probably something like hip, hippocampal-based memory is sort of more specific to something like spatial problems, um, and some of this other stuff might might be not very specific. Um, you know, I think part of what I was talking about also is that uh, something like intertemporal decision making feeds into a lot, a lot of other contexts. So even though I'm arguing that it might evolve for foraging, it, there are intertemporal choices that play a crucial role in cooperation and all sorts of other domains. So I don't think I would consider them to be properly a module either, although they may differ in their functional specialization. I kind of have a related question, which is that, um, you know, because uh, across this whole, uh, 
seminar series we've had so far, you know, people talking um, from the perspective of human foraging or non-human primate foraging, rodents, um, ants, bees, lots of different organisms. And so foraging behaviors in those different organisms are very different, right? Like what exactly a foraging behavior is, how is it, 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 it is expressed? Um, there are some fundamentals, uh, um, as Alex introduced in the, in the first talk, um, as to what most people would consider foraging. But I mean, on a similar note, I mean, do you think that, uh, especially because you're both interested in non-human primates, do you think this is the sort of ultimate organism, for example, so to speak, to, to like understand foraging? Um, I mean, do, or, or should we, uh, I mean, is foraging something that we should consider sort of an umbrella term that does actually capture, I don't know, uh, foraging behaviors in, in different species or, yeah. Uh, I, I would, uh, my, my, uh, I, yeah, I'll give probably a bad answer, but I think of foraging more as an intellectual perspective rather than a particular set of things. And so it's more like a, a philosophical orientation that says, let's make it natural. Let's use foraging type, let's use things that are derived from the animal's natural lives. And that's going to cause a lot of changes in the way you do your experiments and the way you interpret your data. And any of those things are what I would call foraging rather than like any particular behavior, you know, grabbing fruit or looking for ants in an anthill or something like that. Yeah, I would, I would agree. I mean, foraging is sort of a function, like finding food that then allows you to have calories, that then allows you to have babies and reproductive success. And what different animals are doing probably varies a lot. And so the, I, I do think also the problems that are posed in the context of foraging can vary a lot depending on the characteristics of the animal, the food that they're eating, but, but also actually the social context of this. So, you know, I kind of touched on with you know, with both chimps and bonobos, they're very gregarious. So when they're making foraging decisions, they're almost always around other animals, which means that feeding competition is really important. But there are other species, like there are some um, fairly asocial lemurs and, and other species that aren't primates, of course, there's lots, that, that are fairly solitary and they don't face that kind of uh, social trade-off when they're making foraging decisions. So, you know, there's a version of this where I say most of social decision-making falls under this umbrella if you're a gregarious primate, um, but maybe if you're some other kind of solitary living species, it really wouldn't be part of the same problem solving set at all, um, that your social interactions would focus primarily on a brief mating interaction and that's it. And it wouldn't have anything to do with foraging at all. Uh, I'll, I will echo that and and I'll say, you know, like, for example, if we think of mating, mating is something that we can easily apply foraging theoretic concepts to understanding or like something I'm trying to think of something that's, not, that's definitely not foraging, like sleeping, but even sleeping involves an optimization and a trade off and, you know, things, their benefits and costs to sleeping and when you sleep and where you sleep. And so it is actually probably very amenable to a pr understanding through the lens of foraging theory. It's not to say that's the best lens or the only lens to look at it through, but it's probably a good tool that's gonna to help us gain some insight into it. And so I, you know, the more I think about it, there's probably no aspect of animal life that you wouldn't benefit from at least taking that perspective for a few minutes. Hmm, yeah, oh, should I? I saw Hannah also unmuted. I'll go first. <laughs> first of all, I just want to say sorry about the, uh, apologize for the uh, technical issues I had earlier. And I want to say thanks to Laura for uh, picking up the pieces while I was gone. And it's, it's great to be back. <laughs> but um, yeah, I was also um, similar to what Laura was uh, thinking, kind of drawing um, some of the other themes that we've been talking about in our series so far, I, it got me thinking about um, our last episode, uh, which was on olfactory foraging. And um, you know, we we heard um, in this in this talk in these talks that uh, olfactory um, sort of decision making and olfactory sen uh, sensation is very very important across the animal kingdom for um, foraging. Um, and I wasn't so sure. Um, how that whether that importance is retained in for example humans or and my kind of assumption that is that in sort of naturalistic human foraging or factory uh, information isn't maybe as important as other um, areas of the kind of 
animal kingdom. And I was just wondering if you guys have any insights also whether that scales further down uh, within the primate taxa. You know, did we recently lose? Well, okay, first of all, have we lost our, our importance uh, um, placed on olfaction? And if so, at what point do you think that kicked in or evolved? Are you in Portugal? Yeah. Do you have movie theaters in malls in Portugal that speak popcorn smell in, oh, yeah. <laughs> and broadcast it around the mall to encourage you to come to the movie theater? Sure. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> I think there's at least some. I think there's at least some olfactory foraging left. Yeah. Yeah, you're right. But I mean, you know, based looking at animals that are, you know, fully fully, uh, you know, use, rely mostly on olfactory signals to guide their foraging. I, I wondered, yeah, I don't, yeah, it's true that for sure we still have some, but I don't know really when applied to a natural context, how relevant these end up being. Maybe, maybe it's a bit of a question of what role the olfactory signals play in the foraging uh, as well, right? Like whether it's raising motivation to seek or whether it's the guy's <laughs> cue for localizing the food yeah i agree i i think that you know olfactory cues um clearly are something humans and many other primates can pick up on but the kinds of information they're extracting from that might be different from other species so uh like for yeah i agree that like probably localizing food like to specific spots is somewhat less important for for humans or chimpanzees or something. Um, on the flip side, I'd say the lemurs we're studying are clearly much more olfactory than anthropoid primates, um, and they have, you know, like a social olfactory organ, and you know they're signaling to each other a lot of olfactory cues. And um, so, in our studies, we we spend a lot of time ensuring that they're not using olfactory cues to solve the problem a different way um, by like making sure the smell is everywhere and whatever. But one question is whether they would be actually doing something different if we provided them with the full complement of cues that a natural real life foraging situation would have, right? So in real life, chimpanzees are not foraging based purely on spatial memory because they're gonna have olfactory cues and visual cues and they're gonna have procedural memory and they're gonna have all this stuff working in parallel but if we want to understand the specific contribution of one skill we need to extract that out of the picture um so i think a really interesting question is what happens when you put it all back in like how how does that all work in tandem you know one of my best friends in graduate school was an olfactory psychophysicist and geneticist and he his what his opinion was given the high prevalence of specific anosmias in humans we are undergoing rapid well, there's a rapid reduction in selective pressure to maintain those. We're basically losing the ability to smell because it's just not very important anymore. And it's happening, you know, as fast as evolution happens, which is over the course of hundreds of thousands of years. Uh, but on the other hand, a lot of his research demonstrated, psychophysical research demonstrated that human olfactory abilities are much, much stronger than we tend to think they are and much more influential in a much, many more contexts. And so if you put those together, I think the answer is, yeah, it's still pretty important, but probably not as important 10 years from now as it was 10 years ago. And if you expand out to 100,000 years, even more so. Yeah, I think that's a, an interesting point also because, um, you know, one of the ideas, I, I mentioned this idea, this cooking hypothesis that a crucial shift for humans was this transition to a cooked diet. And it's clear that there actually are genetic signatures of this transition in humans where, um, for example, humans have um, um, more salivary amylase that allows us to digest starch. I don't know that anybody specifically looked at like degradation of olfactory signaling in that same perspective but i wouldn't be that surprised like you know humans were were there's clearly no selection or much reduced selection on having the third molar this is why people get their wisdom teeth um pulled out whereas you know other animals need their third molar they're not that's fitting in their face and they're chewing their food which is much tougher than ours um 
So it seems very likely that this transition to a very soft cooked food diet has changed the selective regime humans are under. Um, and there's some really interesting work actually on rodents looking at how like, you know, you know, urban rats basically feed on human garbage. So some of the same selection on humans has probably been imposed on urban animals that depend on our trash because they're eating the same stuff. And you actually see some of these same genetic signatures in them. So that would be an interesting question of like, you know, there's sort of this suite of things that goes into this transition and diet. Right, yeah, I think there's also um, signatures of in, in, in the dog genome as well for these dietary changes as well. Yeah, thanks for that answer for both of you. Can I ask a question? Um, this goes a bit uh, back to the earlier part of the discussion. I was curious in uh, cases where you have populations um, Kind of like social, it, sort of it's it's a question about the social aspect of foraging. Do you, if you compare separate populations of um, animals, do they um, develop sort of distinct um, strategies? Like, for example, one that is more focused on cooperative foraging versus less cooperative foraging, and like, you know, what factors influence that? Like, is there is it for example, purely uh, a function of the environment, or is there something where you can also find like propagation of, you know, maybe newfound knowledge that that enables a certain strategy, things like that. Um, So do you mean like different populations of the same species that they might develop different kinds of ways of solving the same problem? Yeah. Yeah, because you were mostly contrasting different species, and I was wondering whether within the same species, you you know, what level of differentiation you find. Yeah, I, I think that's uh, an important question, and it's something where I think our work in captive context is probably not very well situated to address it. But um, what I would speculate, based on what we know of wild animals, is that there definitely, you know, there are differences. For example, with chimps, chimpanzees show incredible behavioral variation in the wild. There's a lot of debates about whether this reflects something cultural or, or some kind of learned tradition versus it's just a response to variation in the environment. Because of course, chimps also live in a very pretty widely diverse swath of Africa. So there are chimps living in dense rainforests and chimps living in savanna environments and you know chimps living in mixed environments. So you know as as one specific example, um, different populations of chimps seem to have different strategies for hunting monkeys. So wherever chimps and red colobus monkeys coexist, chimps like to hunt and eat red colobus monkeys. But in some places they have a more individualistic strategy of just like one animal grabs prey. And in another context, they might, it's at least something that's happening more in a social group, whether or not it's really cooperative is sort of a, an issue of debate. Um, you know, and some folks have said that this is because of differences in the ecology that they're living in favors different strategies, because if you're in a very dense forest, you can't see everything, it's better to kind of be in a group or something. And that if you're in a different environment, this sort of solo hunting can be more um, efficacious. But I don't think we really know because you know there's not there's there haven't been experience experiments on this to really tease apart the mechanisms. But that would be sort of for me an obvious candidate for trying to address a question like what you're asking. Great. Um, so we actually we have um, a question again from uh, Alex Kasanik. Oh, unless sorry, Ben, I wasn't sure if you had any more to add there on that. Uh, no, I don't. Uh, that was a great answer. Yeah, great. So, um, yeah, so as uh, previously mentioned, Alex was our first uh, speaker in our first episode. So I feel it's quite fitting to end our final episode of the series uh, also with a word from Alex. So he, he asked the question, are humans really more pro-social or just differentially conditioned by their upbringing? A recent meta-analysis by Burton Cello and West in 2021 concluded that in all public goods games, humans progress towards self-maximizing as they understand the game, their personal feedback, their payoff, or like in brackets, their payoff. Could this apply to other primates?
Um, I mean, my answer to that question would be, I do think that that kind of experience and sensitivity to local social context is very important for understanding what humans are doing. But I also think there is a major difference in the scope between what a human is doing in, routinely across human societies and, and, and what a something like a chimpanzee or some other primate like that is doing. Um, I, I don't think that chimpanzees approach problems that humans naturally see as a potential opportunity to cooperate, which doesn't mean this kind of um, potentially uh, puzzling aspects of cooperation that people have invoked something like group selection to explain, but even something like reciprocity or whatever that we don't need to invoke special evolutionary mechanisms to explain. I, I don't. I think humans are doing something different. Chimps don't see it as a an opportunity to do something social. I think in the same way, uh, and I would I would go back to that you know difference in the feeding ecology, which is that the human ecological niche depends on food sharing and some level of cooperative interaction that chimps just don't. Uh, once a chimpanzee is you know a couple of years old, basically a hundred percent of the food that they're eating is food that individual chimpanzee obtained, um, and this is not true of hunter gatherers where you know there's a, a major intergenerational or within generational transfer of food that hinges on some kind of cooperative interaction, be it between kin or something. It doesn't have to be something like group selection. So I do think that there is a difference in the scope there between other primates and humans. I, I will, um, I'll just add a methodological point, which is uh, I've done a good amount of game theory studies in monkeys, and I've consulted on some game theory studies in apes, and I am personally very skeptical of any game theoretical results that come from monkeys. I, I think there's a lot of difficulties in actually implementing those experiments well, so I would have uh, I don't. I don't think much could be drawn from those. The ape work, I think, is much better, um, probably because of apes are a lot smarter than monkeys. Um, and I'm. I also. I do have some concerns about drawing conclusions about human behavior or animal behavior and life from game theoretical context. I think that. I think that we tend to be very generous with the results of game theoretical studies, and assume that they will generalize readily when the evidence for that is is not particularly strong. So the answer is we don't know. <laughs> well, I don't know anything about apes. All I know is for monkeys, we don't. We definitely don't know. Great, Th thank you for both of those answers. Um, so I think that's more or less us out of time now. Um, so that just leaves uh, it to thank um, all of the speakers that we've had throughout the whole of the six episodes. Um, if any, one would like to uh, re-watch any of the episodes that we've had. Um, you can find us on YouTube with all, um, all the five episodes so far are already up. Um, so you can just re-watch them uh, at your leisure. Yeah, so we'd like, also like to thank all of the speakers that we've had and all of our guest panelists, uh, and including Alex and Ben today. And uh, yeah, just finally, um, keep uh, please stay uh, tuned for potential um, kind of, uh, information about potentially a second series that we'll be working on in the in the future um, and yeah thanks a lot everyone um, yeah take care and thank you very much for hosting <laughs> really wonderful thanks a lot thank you yeah thank you to our audience of course yeah yeah, yeah. 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 Thank, thank you all thank you for joining us <laughs> And Dennis isn't on now, but he's another of our organizers. So thanks, Dennis, too. <laughs> Bye, Ben. <laughs>